thought that's hitting my mind right now is um, uh, the struggle that is involved in becoming an actor. My God. First of all, what does the J stand for, by the way, in your name? John. Raymond John Barry. How can you use uh, Raymond J. Barry? Uh, affectation, when I was too young to know better, I should have called myself Ray Barry, like everybody calls me. Yeah. But I wanted to appear to be what? I don't know. You know, I don't know why I used the, my full name. Yeah. Uh, uh, and affectation is the word that comes to my mind. I don't call myself Raymond J. Barry, <laughs> but people do. Yeah. They'll come out, you're Raymond J. Barry, aren't you? You know, okay, so, you know, I'm kind of used to it. But had I to do it all over again, I would have called myself Ray, yeah. Ray Barry. <laughs> make, it, make it as easy as possible. <laughs> yeah. yeah, you know, and that's what people call me. And, you know, <clears throat> it's unnecessary to add all those vowel and consonant <laughs> sounds. <laughs> well, I, I mean, the, the thing I see is a lot of people altering their names for ethnic reasons or whatever, like they want, oh. you know. If... Well, I tell you, I think there was another thing, too, because I was enamored with the notion of being a classical actor or somebody could do Shakespeare or whatever. I, you know, I wanted to uh, achieve. And a Shakespearean actor would call himself Raymond J. Barry. Yeah as opposed to Ray Barry. Hey, Ray, you know, <laughs> Raymond <laughs> is a big difference. Yeah, no, it works. You know what I mean? Yeah. But I was too young. I didn't know what the hell I was doing. So where, where did you grow up? I grew up in Long Island, a town called Lindbrook, which is about maybe 45 minutes by train outside of uh, <clears throat> uh, New York City. And what, what inspired you to go into acting? growing up there? Uh, phew. You know, <clears throat> um, I needed the attention. Uh, I chose acting knowing I'd be up in front of people and there was something in me that needed that. Um, previous to being an actor, I achieved that by being a, uh, an athlete with a modicum of success, enough to get a scholarship to Brown University and be drafted by the Boston Patriots, which is now the New England Patriots. The reason I was drafted was not because I was any great football player, I was okay. I was, I was all right, you know, I was good. But the backfield coach at Brown, a guy named Milt Peppel, had played for Notre Dame, he was an All-American, he played for the Detroit Lions. He knew Bay Pirelli, he was the head coach at the Boston. So he called up Bay Pirelli and he said, you should draft this guy. I could run, I, I ran a nine, 900, numerous times, and I ran a 21-1, 220, which was ranked nationally. It was like ninth. Mm -hmm. It's not Olympics, you know. Still but pretty, ninth, pretty good. You know, of all the colleges, I was ninth, you mm -hmm. know. And you played basketball, too. Yeah, but I was a very good basketball player. Uh, the, the real point is I found achievement without words. I, I could perform physically in front of... Uh, a lot of people, you know, a football game at Brown, you'd have 45,000 people, you yeah. know, depending upon the team you're playing. And, uh, you know, hey, Ray, you know, all that approval. The fact is, um, I stopped talking when I was a little kid. I became very quiet. And uh, I uh, got a lot of attention from that talking. Yeah. Oh, Ray, he's really quiet. Look, he never talks, you know. I think people are curious about you when you don't speak. Like, they're curious yeah. what you're thinking. Well, so. I got hip to that one, and I began to do ridiculous stuff, you know. Like, I, I would count the number of words I said in a, in a day. I, I was really <laughs> w 
just too much. And uh, <clears throat> long story short, I did that for 10 years, and uh, then what do I do? Uh, I decided to become an actor. Why? Because some professor asked me to be in a play. And I knew immediately, wow, that'd be interesting. I, uh, uh. My mother was an artist, so I had been influenced by my mother, her creativity. She was a published writer, she was a painter. So I can't talk, because I haven't used my tongue for 10 years. And I want to be an actor. <laughs> I, it was, you know, it was a struggle. I, I had to work, I, I put a cork in my mouth. I still do it today, 50 years later. And I do Shakespeare, oh, for me, with a cork, like that. So I thought, thank God. And then I take the cork out and I can speak yeah. with fluidity. And uh, it was real. The muscles in my tongue were not operative because I hadn't used them. So I'm an actor now, right? And I can't act my way out of a paper bag. I'm, I'm, I'm slow, I'm not spontaneous, I'm not given to impulse, I refuse, I don't know, a certain kind of arrogance connected with it too, I don't know. And also I'm a jock, you know, so I'm, I, I got this, uh, uh, this impulse to use kind of muscularity when I work. This is at age 21. Yeah. So I'm tight as a board, I can't, I'm not articulate, I, and the long story short is that um, I worked very, very hard at um, um, becoming capable. Oh, another factor, I was frightened to death. Acting scared the heck out of me, man. Yeah. And uh, long story short, I put my hand in a fire and I left it there. And pretty soon, uh, not pretty soon, it took... Us. Oh, I started working with a wonderful company called The Open Theater, directed by a genius director, Joseph Chaikin. Mm -hmm. I think and, I may have seen a video from that. Yeah. That was very experimental, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, we did a famous play called The Serpent that took New York by storm. It got a wonderful front page review, full page, picture of myself and Ralph Lee. I played Kane. Uh, the play was brilliant. It was written by Jean-Claude Vanitelli, directed by... Joseph Chick, and it took uh, two years to improvise and build, and it was about the Bible. Mm. And uh, Cain and Abel, the eating of the apple, the forbidden apple, uh, Adam and Eve, uh, the first copulation, and then relating those motifs with political events that were happening in our society, like the assassination of President Kennedy was in the play. Yeah. It has been true up to this point that we've been relatively independent from uh, people's business, which has allowed us to make our own kind of theater and to make somewhat of a statement. It's not as strong as it might be politically, but it has been ours. This all stemmed from Joseph Chaikin's brilliant mind, coupled with a talented, talented group of people mm. who could do improvs, tell stories improvisationally that were brilliant. I mean, I saw work in those workshops that really, I'll never forget. They were so talented, these people, James Barbosa, Peter Maloney, oh my goodness, Paul Zimmet, uh, of Shami Chaikin, Joe Chaikin's sister. These people, you probably never heard of, of any of them. Oh, Sam Shepard was one of our writers. <laughs> he, Pretty good writer to have. Yeah, he, he worked on Serpent. He yeah. worked on the Serpent. 
Megan Terry was one of our writers, <clears throat> Susan Yankowitz, very talented people. And the actors were asked to do improvisations every day. Wow. And then we perform uh, 175 performances a year, 200 performances a year, in places like Paris, the Roundhouse Theater in London, the Shiraz Festival in Iran. I oh, met the you were all over the world acting, yeah. all over the world. Uh, Algiers and Mustaganam in Algeria. <laughs> uh, Copenhagen, Zurich in Switzerland, all through the United States, all through Canada. And we did this every year for something like eight years or so, after which the company terminated. And we did, uh, Joe started another thing, which I always worked on. And also I would do, pro pro he always hired me, Joe. And um, I, I did, for example, Wojciech. With, uh, I played the drum major uh, at the uh, Joe Papp's Public Theater. He directed it. I did Tourists and Refugees with him at La Mama. He directed it. Um, uh, he used me a lot, and we got along. And I, I'll be honest with you, man, I don't think I, I, I would be an actor if it weren't for Joe, Joe Chaikin. Hmm. I'll tell you that right now. Hmm. Running around, uh, doing rounds and auditioning, forget it, man. I wouldn't have done that. I worked with him st steady yeah. during an incubation period where I needed, uh, <clears throat> what do they call it? Uh, some kind of a paradigm, a, a model. I needed somebody to look up kind to, a mentor. a mentor. Yeah, you needed a mentor to kind of guide That's you through it. this whole thing. I needed that and I was weak in many ways. I was very sort of vulnerable in a way. So, but then you got stronger and stronger in live performance. And now you can't play. stop me. <laughs> <laughs> well, so then at what point did you transi transition into film? Well, mind you, I did something, I don't know, dozens of plays. I might have done 50, 60, 70 plays in New York. And in between productions, if I, I did a lot of stuff at the New York Shakespeare Festival. Joe Papp hired me a lot. He liked me. He gave me uh, my first lead role on a Broadway play, The Leaf People, um, at the booth. Uh, well, in between shows, I would do part-time jobs, right? Yeah. I, and I got this, uh, this friend of mine, Ken Weller, who's an ex-con, and he was a great plumber. And um, I find out I got to do an audition, and I'm working for Ken to make money. I got no money because I'm in between shows. I'm working on West, West Broadway, uh, and I got to uh, take a sledgehammer, break the concrete, and then dig a trench three feet deep so he can lay drain pipes. I do that all, all day. I got an audition with Michael Cimino, who has won an Oscar for Deer Hunter. Yeah. One, one of the great war movies of all time, too. So, yeah. Yeah. And I, this audition which I'm going to have, I'm in my early 40s by this time, uh, can change my life. Yeah. Oliver Stone wrote the script. <laughs> this is Year of the Dragon. Yeah. Long story short, I show up covered with dirt and pit tar on my arms and, you know, I'm, I'm like, really? I don't even, I mean, I kind of knew it, but I didn't give it, I didn't care. I, you know, I showed up and I had the mud on the boots and the pants and I was there to read, man. I was ready. But because I was so tired and because I had been like doing the stuff with a sledgehammer and all this stuff, I didn't give a shit. Yeah. I didn't care. I was so exhausted. I went to go home. I wasn't all, you know, bottled up with nerves and I, my body was completely relaxed because it was so fatigued from doing that kind of work. 
All right, so I go in there and I do the reading, and then they call me back a second time, uh, and it's the same. I'm doing the same gig, man. And that, is that the casting director, or is, it, or is Michael Camino in the in the Michael casting? Cimino. Yeah. He, he looks at me, he doesn't say anything, you know. It's just like that. He's very sort of pensive and observant and uh, dark eyes, very, very intense, uh, kind of a roundish face and intense. And he's looking. Everybody, the casting directors are talking about my work in the open theater to him. Mm -hmm. He's not even saying a word. Yeah. So I do the reading. <clears throat> Long story short, I get the role. Mickey Rock is playing the lead. I'm playing Mickey Rock's best friend and his boss. Mm -hmm. And it's a great role. It's the second lead in the movie. Uh, so... We shoot for about two weeks, and I'm doing okay. I really prepared for it. I, I felt my work was okay. He comes up to me, and by that time we know, uh, Michael comes up to me, and we know each other a little bit, and he said, somehow he says to me, you know, I knew I was going to hire you the first time I laid eyes on you. I said, how come you called me in three times? <laughs> what, were you breaking my balls? And he said, no, I, could, I, 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 I wanted to figure out if you could read. <laughs> and we both laughed. Uh -huh. He said, the way you looked, you were covered with dirt. And you had crap under your fingernails. It was like, I couldn't believe you walked into an audition like that. I was so used to guys walking in with a nice little suit jacket and a tie and all clean <laughs> and shaven. And you walked in like... Uh, you know, uh, Anthony Quinn crawling out of a tunnel or something. <laughs> and, you know, on the basis of that, he, he said to me, I knew immediately I was going to hire you. And uh, I said, well, you broke my balls. You, you didn't have to friggin', uh, uh, you know, like make me read three times, did you? <laughs> and then he brought Mickey in to give the okay, and Mickey gave the okay immediately. We got along very well. Was that intimidating work, working with Mickey Rourke? Because he was huge back then, too. Yes, he was. Uh, intimidating for a, a bit. Uh, but then I realized Mickey, he doesn't know his lines. He writes them on his hand, and then he'll write them on the wall. And he's quite brilliant the way he manu maneuvers his body to be able to read and then he'll go back and, you know, say the words. They're paraphrased. And it was very good for me because it made me on high, put me on high alert. I had to really listen to what he was saying to know when to speak because the cues were different every time we did a take. But that was good for me because there was no such thing as, you know, kind of like going by rote. And I said the words, I, I always say the letter perfect, you know. Uh, so that was no problem. But um, I did okay in that movie, and Oliver Stone cast me from that movie in Born on the Fourth of July as Tom Cruise's father. And lo and behold, my... Was he on set during that, or did he just see the movie because he, he was one of the writers? He wasn't on set. Okay, so he saw the movie, he, he, he had written it. He saw the movie on the basis of the movie. He told me later on, after he made me read too, that he knew that from the movie he wanted to use me as Tom Cruise's father. Yeah. And uh, the Born on the Fourth of July was a big success, and uh, I had one scene in it that I am very proud of when Tom Cruise comes home paralyzed and uh, uh, I, I was very vulnerable in that scene. And uh, I'm proud of the work in, in, in it. Um, and uh, the prelude to that vulnerability is a, uh, a, an anecdote um, having to do with, uh, we didn't know we were going to shoot that scene. It rained. We had to be indoors. And suddenly we were going to shoot this very vulnerable scene where my son is coming home paralyzed from Vietnam for the first time. He's in a wheelchair. He'll never walk again. You can imagine. 
And uh, that morning, uh, we shot another scene where I had one line, and uh, Carolyn Carver and myself and Tom Cruise, where he pleads his case that he wants to go to Vietnam. And, you know, I didn't have much, I didn't have anything to say, really. And, you know, I, I looked at Carol, uh, Carolyn, you know, once in a while, and after we shot the scene, we're going to do something else, and they changed the schedule because it's going to rain. Oliver comes over to me and he says, what were you doing? You didn't do anything. I, I'm looking at him, what? I, couldn't you scratch your cheek or something? I mean, it was like a lot of that footage is on the, going to be on a, the cutting room floor. I, I mean, you didn't do anything. I said, Oliver, I, I had one line, man. He's, he said, yeah, but I mean, I don't know. And he walks away and I'm crushed. Mm. So then I find out we're going to do the scene where Tom Cruise comes home paralyzed, my son in a wheelchair, and I'm destroyed. Well, long story short, the work I did in that scene was brilliant. I couldn't have done it myself. Oliver did that to me on purpose. After we finished the afternoon scene, he came over and gave me a big hug and he said, I'm sorry, you know, I, 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 I'm sorry I did that to you, but I knew what we'd get and we did, man. That scene is so vulnerable. It's a short scene and I could have probably expanded it because I had so much going. But that's Oliver Stone. He's a great director. Out of all the directors, I think I, I think he he somehow well, that's the way he does it. He gets the best performances that out of every actor he works with. Tell at, me at about some it. point, I have Val Kilmer in The Doors, Tom Cruise in Born on the Fourth of July. He just gets amazing performances out of his actors. It's the best thing Tom ever did. The best thing. Yeah. I, yeah. I, you know, I'm hesitant to say it's the best thing I've ever done because. I think there were other things that had a totally different uh, emotional life, like Interview with the Assassin. I'm yeah. very proud of that work. And also Dead Man Walking, I feel very proud of that work. Uh, so I'm hesitant to say it's the best thing, but that one scene is one of the best things I've ever done. Yeah. And I uh, completely am in gratitude to Oliver Stone for pulling that out of me. You run into him around? I mean. Once I was invited to a, uh, some kind of a, a, a public talkathon about the film, and Oliver was there, and I was there. Tom Cruise was not there, but uh, there were a number of people in the film who showed up, and they showed the film, and then afterward they had a panel discussion. And I saw Oliver at that time. And, um, oh boy, uh, <laughs> you know, I must say, um, <clears throat> the transition that I personally have gone through over the past 50 years, uh, there are remnants of the original me when I wasn't speaking very much with people, not communicating, very cut down, very shut down emotionally. And uh, the profession, the art of it, has taught me to open up and relax a little bit. But gee whiz, I think of some turning points in my career where I, I was just so shattered emotionally by fear or insecurity or low self-esteem or not knowing what the heck I'm doing or whatever it is. But somehow I've managed to put the pieces together again every time and um, uh, become a bigger person perhaps because I can embrace my frailties now. I can embrace the the shattered part, and say, that's me too. 
That's the fodder of, with which I work. The uh, dysfunctionality, the sensitivity, the, uh, the part of me that doesn't know which end is up. It's very useful, that part of me. Uh, whatever, for whatever it's worth. I mean, you try to figure out why you do something like act. And that's one of the reasons uh, over the decades what I've done is um, I've made use of all the dysfunctionality and the stuff that worked for me too, you know. Um, it's not just one thing, it's beast and intellectual. It's soft, it's hard, it's female, it's male. There's a lot of cross-section of behavior inside me and possibly all of us. And I feel that I've used that with this profession. And wow, you know, there's something to it. I, I'm 79 now. I'll be 80 in six months. And what a friggin' experience, what a ride. Oh my gosh. And it's not just, oh, hey, I'm in the movies. It's not that at all. It's the, the uncovering that I've experienced and I'm still experiencing, you know. <clears throat> it's very, you know what it does? It makes me conscious. I'm, I haven't fallen asleep, yeah. and I love that. I'm conscious, I'm alive, I'm alert. And that is really cool, man. Because you're constantly growing, you're constantly finding stuff new about yourself, sometimes like through these performances too. Yeah. Or through, I know you, you paint too, so you do artwork. I write, I'm writing know. a memoir, by the way. Oh, great. Okay. Yeah. Two, three chapters of it I've had published. Oh. Um, in literary reviews, very often connected with universities. One is going to come out uh, uh, in October, uh, it's being done by a, a San Francisco uh, review uh, called Caveat Lecter. And, uh, you know, it's an essay about my mother and her influence on me. Oh, do you know what I did with my mother? One night we had a long conversation and I said to her, after we were talking about very personal things, did you ever have any affairs when you were married to my father? They didn't get along, by the way. And she said yes. And then she, we had a little discussion. And then the next day she wrote me this long, beautiful, poetic letter and I read the letter, and I, w I had my own theater company in New York, Cana Company, and we were working on a play which I wrote called Blue Heaven. And uh, I asked her if she would read the letter in between scenes. Oh, wow. And she said to me, oh, Raymond, I don't know. But she did it. Long story short, as months went by and we did more and more performances, she memorized the letter and performed it. Then I used her for three more plays and she began to act with the company. Then people got hip to her and we did Barry Child together in St. Louis. I played Tilda and she played the mother. Those two characters have incest together, by the way, in Barry Child, the Sam Shepard right. play. We did Antigone together with Joseph Chaikin directing. Uh, she was in the chorus and I played Creon. And uh, long story short, she became an actress. Yeah. I got her uh, an agent. Jerry Kahn, 
he began to send her out and she picked up commercials and <laughs> she uh, did trading places with Eddie Murphy. She did 20 movies. Wow. She did Arthur with Liza Minnelli and uh, commercials. She got vested for a pension. Uh, she was in two commercials in one Super Bowl at halftime, and she became an actress when she was 61 until she was 88. Wow, it's never too late to start. <laughs> yeah, and she passed away when she was 94. Mm -hmm. And we're both friends with Estelle Harris, who, you know, start, I, I know she started late, but, you know, really hit big on Seinfeld and Toy Story and, you know, didn't, Did she start late? I, I don't know about starting late, but I don't. I don't know if there was a lot of film work before that. There was. There may have been plays too. I don't know. I don't. I don't know about her early career. Right. But you know, Seinfeld was a huge breakthrough, obviously, and then right. Toy Story, voiceover stuff, and you right. know. But um, yeah, I, it's, it's that's the great thing about this. About this, and even stand-up comedy is like it's never too late to start. Like if, if you if you can bring something to the yeah. to the craft, you yeah, can start yeah. at any time. Yeah. I know. Um, but you worked, so you worked so hard in doing plays and really got that muscle, the acting muscle down before you went into film. Like a lot of people, you know, they'll try, maybe, maybe they'll start really early and they don't really get the craft down before they start getting these roles and then, you know. I mean, this is true. I spent 23 years uh, doing theater before I really began to make a lot of film. I don't know if I agree with you that, or the implication of what you said, that that is a better thing. Well, I don't know if it's better. I, I don't mean, either. I mean, it, maybe it. I mean, maybe starting early and going directly into film is a, is a way to yeah. go. But it, it just seems like it seems like you're like if you go that route, you might not be ready to give a great performance, and then you're you're going to be looked at as like you know mediocre until you know like you came to the screen after you were pretty seasoned. And oh, I was very seasoned, yeah. yeah. I, it is a very specific muscle that you develop when you have to be on stage for two hours in front of an audience and say the words, say what is written, because it's literature. You can't paraphrase. The writer is sitting in the third row. Uh, it, it's a whole different ball game. It, 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 the, you, when you're shooting a movie, you'll do a scene that may last for two minutes. It's a huge difference between uh, two hours and two minutes of concentration. Yeah. And it, it is a different muscle. You, I, it feels different. Um, it helps you. I mean, it helps you memorize. For the, like, if you have to memorize a few pages for a scene the next day, that's no big deal. After you've done these plays, that I mean, that your your memory has to be pretty good to be able to. Uh, I do have good memory. Um, I, this brings up another thing. When you do a lot of stage, there are occasions where you forget your lines, and it's a nightmare. And. It's important for that to happen to you once or twice because what happens in your mind is I'm never going to let that happen again. And what you do is develop a, uh, a preparation that guarantees that that will not happen again. So when I do movies, I say the words exactly or television. I mean really exactly. And I, you know, I, I, from the theater work, the one difference is I show up and I'm ready, baby. I'll kick it out, like bang, bang, bang. And they're always happy because they save time. Oh, yeah. I thought we were going to spend the whole day on this. And, you well, know, they probably they, get that a lot. They get it, I, I, I know they get that a lot, where there's a lot of actors who won't memorize their lines. They won't do the homework. Absolutely. But talking, talking about what you said, though, is like, Whenever, when I've had my worst comedy shows, I've worked my hardest right after that so it doesn't happen again. Like if I there bomb and stand up, I don't want that to happen again. So for the next performance, I'll rewrite, I'll redo That's right. something. That's know? what working in front of people does. It makes you tough in terms of preparation. You will not allow that to happen again. 
Uh, it happened to me twice, and it was a nightmare. And uh, that's what happened to me. I, I said to myself, no, no, we're going to work harder. We're not going to let this baby happen again because I don't like it. Yeah, the horrible <laughs> feeling. It's too much, yeah. you know. Uh, and you can screw up a whole play if you mess up badly enough, you know. It's, I just, geez, I, I have a memory of something. I forget what it was. I think I was doing Hamlet with Rip Torn and Geraldine Page and somebody forgot their lines and a knife. I, I forget what it was. So it, it completely rearranged the play and it was a very important mean, uh, part. I, it wasn't me who forgot, but I remember I, in this particular case, I, I covered for the person and I forget how I did it, but uh, yeah, it is a common thing on live stage or live comedy or whatever. Uh, people forget. They're yeah. vulnerable. They, they make mistakes, yeah. you know. But you don't like being that person. And particularly uh, when you get a, a bit older, you, people expect you're the one who's going to screw up. Bullshit. I'm not going to screw up. I've had directors say, man, you really know your friggin' lines. And I say, well, what did we come here for? To jerk off? You know what I mean? <laughs> well, it's funny. Will Smith, when he was acting early on, he would work so hard to learn the lines and he would learn his, uh, the other character's lines and you could see him mouthing the other character's lines early on. <laughs> oh. so, so you see him mouthing like the other character on, say, on uh, you know, Fresh Prince Bel-Air. <laughs> like kind of interesting to somebody say. must have tipped them off because that's not good yeah well you see these patterns that people go through like George Clooney for a while was kind of moving his head a lot like that and then he stopped that obviously who was, did George Clooney like oh. in some of his movies was kind of doing this a lot and then he stopped doing that for a while I mean I guess he uh. learned but going back going back to Born on the Fourth of July though Tom Cruise was already a pretty big name when he did that movie I mean he had yeah. done Top Gun he'd done I think yeah. a number of other movies that really, I mean, that, that was an amazing performance and you really enhanced it, obviously. Did you guys run lines before? I mean, how did you prep yeah. for that? So <clears throat> how, how often do you run lines with actors before you go on a, on a film set? Um, well, not often. Yeah. So, people, so you just come knowing Well, more? I'll take that back. Sometimes you have a day of rehearsal, mm -hmm. which is ridiculous, because what are you going to rehearse in one day? Yeah. You know, it ain't going to happen. You got to come ready. And if you sit sitting around a table, you're not really doing the physical action. The environment is, you know. I think those table reads are generally for the cast to put their eyes on each other and meet each other and kind of unify before the shooting starts. They don't have a lot of luxury for rehearsal. Yeah. So, you know, running lines is kind of like, um, okay, you can do it. I guess it serves some purpose, maybe more for the director than for the actors. To but see how the performance is going, see how the lines might be said, and yeah, if anything comes off. When it's... people run lines, they're not even performing. Yeah. You know, they're just doing the words. They're doing the mechanics of it. Um, uh, and the other thing is that when you actually are shooting a scene, you do the scene many times. That's true, yeah. So you don't want to shoot your wad trying to get to results when the cameras are not running. Mm -hmm. You want your best work when the cameras are running. So you're not going to have a read-through where you're just giving everything you have. You got to save it for the camera, which uh, is also true of rehearsing a play. You don't have to break your balls every time you run through a scene. Uh, if there's no audience, uh, you know, you, you can try things. You can go forward or go backward, or go sideways, go. You know, be relaxed enough to be able to make mistakes. That's what rehearsals are for. With film, you have the luxury of being able to retake it. 
So you can make him mistakes while you're in front of a camera. They hardly rehearse, is my point. The, the scene becomes matured by taking many takes. You know, sometimes a thing will happen, bang, and it's right. And all they need is three or four takes and then move on. Sometimes the, uh, it's a low budget film and that's all they can afford. And you should know. Yeah. How, um, how many takes would Oliver Stone have you guys do on those on Born on the Fourth of July compared to Michael, Michael Cimino? Or other films you've worked on? Michael Cimino spent hours on each take, each angle. Oliver Stone was not quite as obsessed with more and more takes, uh, but he made sure he got what he needed. Yeah, because we've, we've heard about Stanley Kubrick doing 100 takes for a little scene or something, you know? Yeah. Time, time. Well, a lot of that has to do with how much money they have to spend. Yeah. You know, the budget is a big issue. And that's evolved too, because back when you did those films early on, you're shooting on film, burning film does cost a little more than having a video camera rolling that you could just leave rolling for hours if you needed to. Like yeah. film does add up. Do you, do you, have you seen a difference over time? With where, videotape versus film? Yeah, because now people are shooting with the Reds and Alexas, and yeah, I don't know if you keep track of what cameras are on you, but like, um, you know, before, let's say, 2005, you know, almost everything was done on film. And, and it, they'd have to be a little more tight, probably, I, I'd assume, with the filming. Uh, but I, um, And now what is it? Video well, tape? it's video like this, but like a very, uh, you know, a very high resolution videotape, basically. Right. But it's going to a hard drive. So, right. but it doesn't make a big difference cost-wise if I just leave this camera rolling, as opposed to like, Right now, all these cameras are rolling. If, if this was film, we could roll for, you know, 12 minutes at a time, then stop, then reload, then we'd have to get a loader in to reload the film, and then we'd have to re-spool spool it through the camera, and now I can just leave it rolling. So it's like... Um, Videotape can just keep on going? Yeah, because it's going to a hard drive, yeah. It's going to a, a little SD card or hard drive. Where film, it's, it's finite as far as, you know, you're, you're, you're maybe doing 30-minute rolls uh, with the bigger cameras, but... So you haven't seen like a big effect on where there's, you know, they're cutting more often or like, uh, they probably, I, I'm, I'm assuming they, leave, they can leave it rolling more and just have you, re, you know, do more and more takes. I, I don't know. I do know this when I shot the movie Interview with the Assassin. Yeah, that was video. And that was made to, they that wanted video. that to be, that, they wanted that to be video so it looked like it was a homemade production kind of. Neil Berger directed the, and wrote that and he carried a, a video camera that he could at literally hold like this yeah. when we shot it. No, I this was camera is higher quality than that camera. That's how things have evolved. <laughs> you know? I'm sure. Yeah. Uh, and it really kind of amazed me because and he wanted a documentary look then, to it. Yeah. And he achieved that. And uh, uh, <laughs> it, it really kind of, you know, it, it's where we're going. Well, he was using the media to his advantages, kind of like the Blair Witch Project was a horror film based on found footage. And so it looked like a home video, but they utilized the home video, like creepiness of you can't tell what's going on because there's not as many pixels and what's going on over there. And, you know, and then and the actress or actress is talking to herself through the camera. You're like, oh, so yeah. he was utilizing the medium yeah. for that performance. And also, we have the Subruder film that is very grainy, and that's really our document of what happened on that day. Oh, yeah. But so he did a brilliant job of utilizing the media to to make that film with you. Oh yeah, he 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 also did the Illusionist and Limitless with I think Robert De Niro. That's a was, great movie, Limitless. Yeah, yeah. He, he made those two films. Um, he's a, a, an interesting guy to work for. Uh, 
I was very happy to um, be given that role. Uh, it was very interesting, really. Um, you know, I don't. I saw just. I did Justified for uh, five seasons, and I never saw one episode. Are you serious? Yeah. How come? Well, that's why I bring it up. Um, uh, most of the stuff that I have done, I don't see, and I, I feel perfectly comfortable with that. Um, for a number of reasons. Number one, um, I feel a bit like a silly person to go running off, oh, I gotta watch myself. Uh, excuse me, I'm gonna watch myself on TV tonight. Uh, you don't mind, do you? I, you know, I mean, I, th that's number one. Um, the other is, and I'm noticing this, uh, that it doesn't bother me at all. I, I, I trust what other people say more than I trust myself, because if I look at myself, I don't know. I see. I, I don't know what's going on. I'm not terribly critical of myself either. Um, but uh, that that's part of the experience. I, I it's I don't mind seeing myself. As a matter of fact, my kid played something I was in the other night, and I said I looked at it and I. Said, is that me? <laughs> and it was, you know, it was me, and we watched it for a bit, and it was okay, you know, I liked it. But I don't get, I don't know what it is. Uh, I don't, at this juncture, I, I'm not, um, I don't know. I just am not terribly, uh, it's over, it's done. I like making it. Yeah. I really like making it. Uh, I like the experience of being in it. Uh, but being outside of it, looking at the object, does not really do that much for me. Now, if it were playing, I would watch it. You know, it's not like I'm adverse to the experience of watching myself, but I don't go out of my way. And I never saw it justified once. And I heard I was good in it. I, I, I saw you were good in it. That's what I heard. And by the way, Born on the Fourth of July keeps airing over and over again. And so I, I'll see that frequently, and you're amazing in that too. I mean, it's almost every Fourth of July. Yeah, here, here we are. And it's <laughs> gonna are. it's gonna play probably for the next fifty years every Fourth of July. Yeah. So there's a brilliance to that, like yeah, and, 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 naming and, things after. And Hollywood. part of that is yeah. that it's Oliver Stone. He's like an icon figure, and Tom Cruise. Yeah. You know. Did you? When you were working with Tom Cruise, did you think, I mean, you can't really predict the future. Did you realize, like, okay, this guy is very talented. He's going to have a long career. Like, because you, you can never tell where a career is going to go, I guess. But He was already very famous. And I had no question that he was going to continue to be very famous for the rest of his life. Um, we did well together. I liked him. I think he liked me. One time when we did the scene we were talking about before, after it was all over, he grabbed my arm when I was about to go and he said, you're going to be great in this. And I'll never forget that. Yeah. Um, I, we really kind of got along. I, we, we, I felt we liked each other, you know? I know you worked with Brad Pitt on a TV program, I think, a while back. I yeah. did. Yeah. And, and I also studied in the same class with Brad Pitt when uh, Roy London was alive. We both studied with him. Yeah. So I knew Brad Pitt before he was... And when I worked with Brad Pitt, he wasn't a movie star. Yeah. It was a Tales from the Crypt. And we were both uh, race car drivers. And, uh, you know, um, we got along fine. As a matter of fact, we showed up for the gig and he said, you're in Roy's class, huh? And I s said, yeah. He said, yeah, I remember you. And that was <laughs> our conversation, yeah. you know. 
It's, it's a small town, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, you do run into people. Like in in the comedy world, I run into a lot of the same people over and over again. And I'm sure you will work on. Oh, well, we we can talk about that because you worked with um, uh, Antoine Fuqua in Training Day, and then later you worked with him on, I, on in Ice on Ice, right? That's right. Oh. And while I was working with him on Ice, I forgot that he's talking to Denzel Washington on the phone. And I said, is that then Zell? He goes, and uh, I said to him, tell him Oakland Academy. So Ivan Fuqua says, hey, Denzel, Oakland Academy. And I hear the shout come out of the phone, like, what? <laughs> and let me talk to that motherfucker, you know. And I go to the phone. I say, Denzel, Oakland Academy, huh? He said, what are you talking about? What, where, how do you know that name? I said, I used to teach and I was a football coach there for two years. I, I, my last year was the year before you came. Uh, he went to this private school, Oakland Academy, where I was a teacher and a coach. Oh, wow. Huh. And somebody told me that Denzel went there after I left. I only did it for two years. But that, that's my experience with Ivan Fuqua. Antoine, yeah. Antoine. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, I had a track coach named Ivan, Ivan Fuqua. Yeah. <laughs> but Antoine Fuqua, I worked with on training day. Is that it? Yeah. And then I did that was like That was probably one scene, so that probably wasn't too long. But he must have yeah. remembered you to bring you back for us. Yeah, he did. Yeah. He did remember. Yeah. yeah, I mean, you know, yeah, that, that was a great scene, too. With those actors in that scene, you guys all were amazing you know like even yeah. though there's not a lot of words said yeah it, the, the intensity of going around the room when you guys are talking to denzel about they that. had a name for us i forget what it, the wise men <laughs> that's what it was yeah. yeah 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 go talk to the wise men yeah um this is now this is what a small world it is because we almost crossed path paths years ago because you worked on rapid fire with brandon lee i went to the premiere of that movie with a friend of mine and um what did I do in that? You were the bad guy who um, kind of squealed on the other bad guy. Like you were, yeah. You were kind of like, like a corrupt cop, basically. I was going to be paid. killed, wasn't you, I? And yeah. I kept you, on repeating the same line. Yeah, you had to. You had to say a line to indicate that they're they're supposed to rush in and save you, and you kept on saying the line, but they couldn't hear you because he had patted you or something. Uh, so the ra the transmitter was dead. I'll tell you something interesting about that. Brandon Lee came to see me in Once in Doubt, a play which I wrote in Chicago. Wow. And after we finished. He came up to me and he said, I want to do this play. And I said, great. And then he got killed. Sad, because I, when I saw that movie, I said, this guy, just being Bruce Lee's son is amazing, but also he was really talented. Yes. I mean, he was talented in martial arts and I liked his performance. I thought it was really yeah. strong. And yeah. I thought, this guy's going to go far. This is a good film. I think he, yeah. this is the start of something. And then he got killed. And then he got killed like Bruce Lee did. Like yeah. in, 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 How did in, Bruce Lee get killed? Uh, he had a medical problem, I think. Okay. Um, but, he, but this was a really needless death because he was shot in a stunt scene, a basically. Shot, yeah. It was supposed to be a dummy you know, gun and there was a real bullet. And, I mean, it's crazy. Oh. It, but that, that shows how fragile life is, you know? And it's amazing to... Uh, it it changed uh, the use of guns in films. It ought uh, I mean, that's ridiculous. That it happened. Yeah, he, they left part of a bullet in there. Mm -hmm. And you yeah. can animate a lot of guns now, too. I mean, and you could have even back then, probably, too. But, you know, so you've worked with, you know, some really interesting people. But on the chamber, Gene Hackman, I mean, that's got to be... Was that intimidating, being opposite Gene Hackman? in uh, uh, some scenes? That's an interesting question because I... Cause it, you know, these guys are all like, you know, you're talking about a lot of world-class actors, Tom Cruise, but Hackman, I mean, I, I think most people say he's one of the great actors, you know, in history too. Yeah. 
I tell you. And Robert stuff. Duvall, too. And he worked with Robert Duvall. I worked with Robert Duvall. In what? What was it? That was uh, Falling Down. Falling Down. You know what? In both of those movies, I knew I was working with icon actors. But in one of them, I played the head of the KKK. Yeah, the chamber. In the chamber. And in the other, I, the words were so absolute in that I had to say to Robert Duvall, you know, I don't like you. You know what? You don't curse. Not a fuck or a shit for as long as I've known you. And anybody, you know, that type of verbiage. And I was very sure of who I was because the words were like black and white the head of the KKK in the chamber, I had to say to uh, that guy, uh, what's his name, but Gene Hackman, uh, just that word, you know who you are. And there I was in a, a prison. Yeah. And I didn't care that he was a movie star. And I'll tell you something else. It was Robert Duvall who did this. We finished a scene and he said, come here. And he went over to a telephone and he called up the guy who did Mozart. Milos Forman. Yeah, another great director. And he said, I want you to use uh, this guy, Raymond J. Barry. He's good. Um, write, write down his name. Blah, blah, blah. He's talking to Milos Forman. <laughs> I'm standing right next to the dude. Yeah. And, you know, he's, this guy can do it you know, whatever he said. And he turns back to me, he puts the phone down. I, Thanks. It's okay, you, you should work. End of story. It's really kind of somebody to go out of his way. Yeah. Right after we finished shooting this scene. Yeah. Well, that was a very intense scene too. And I, you know, you're perform you were really strong in that. You know, I forget about that scene. What is that movie again? Falling Come, Down. Falling Down. And that's Robert Duvall, right? Yeah. Robert Duvall and Michael. I got to mention that. People ask me, you know, what are your favorite films and shit like that. And I never mention that one. Falling Down, I should put in there because I had some good stuff with Robert Duvall. Well, Robert Duvall plays the um, kind of, not weak, but um, vulnerable police officer. Yes. So you're kind of the... I'm the hard ass. Yeah, so you're the opposite of him. You're with the, on the punching bag. You're control, yeah. You're putting him down. And he, he, he um, plays kind of a weaker, subservient role to you, so it's very interesting. Because yeah. we're used to seeing him as a very dominant character. In yeah. The films. So that must And I been... had seen him on Broadway, and I had great respect for him. And... Um, it was kind of interesting because I had to say all this hard ass shit to him. And I mean, not that it was difficult, but it was kind of like it was the opposite of what I felt about him. Yeah. Uh, he's an actor who demands great respect from other actors. Right. And Gene Hackman as well. We shot that in Mississippi. Wow. Yeah, wow. <laughs> An interesting place to film a very I know racially tense uh, film I know so you know so you've, been, you've done a lot of great films and you've done a lot of great TV now too with uh, Justified the Hundred Ray Donovan Gotham is there any difference between acting in film and TV no 
same same basic process. But it, the uh, there might be a difference in the amount of time you spend on a scene. Okay, so that's the scheduling is different because it, it's so tight that you have to get this. You have done. a deadline. Yeah. Uh, so that would be the only difference. But I don't think personally, in my own case, spending enormous amounts of time shooting, reshooting, reshooting, reshooting. I don't think it really has a great effect on my performance. Yeah, because you I know. think uh, I kind of kick it in the first five takes at least. Yeah. You know, maybe even the first three. So, you know, uh, the answer is no. What directors uh, would you like to work with that you haven't worked with? Who you haven't worked with? I would like to work with only one person I can think of. But I've worked with her already. Susan Sarandon. Mm -hmm. I love her. I did Dead Man Walking with her. And I think she's wonderful. Aside from her, there's no one I can think of with whom I, I felt a wish I could work with this person. But I'd like to hook up with her again. Mm -hmm. She was really great. Yeah. She won an Oscar for Dead Man Walking. And you know, when she received her Oscar, she thanked me. Oh, wow. Uh, <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, look, I, people can't act alone. I mean, you know, like Tom Cruise wouldn't be what he was in Born on the Fourth of July without you in those scenes, too. So, sure. And, and frankly, like uh, an actor can, can ruin a scene. Like if somebody couldn't bring it for those scenes, they wouldn't be that powerful. Tom would be, you know, by himself thinking and not interacting with his father in a meaningful way. Yeah. So I think everything, every element is important no matter what. Absolutely. I just like her a lot. Yeah. Uh, I can't think of anyone else I, I've actually had that specific wish of, you know, I, I don't think that way, is, you know. What films did you see growing up that inspired you to... On the Waterfront, Marlon Brando, Place in the Sun, Montgomery Clift, and Elizabeth Taylor, uh, Streetcar Named Desire, Vivian Lee, and, uh, and Marlon Brando. Uh, um, it's interesting you say Marlon Brando because he is well known for reading cards around the set too. Yes. Yeah. Well, uh, he changed the face of acting. How so? Well, before uh, Brando hit the scene, there, um, the acting was announced. Like, people were talking like this. They were out there presenting their words. Mm -hmm. Now, not unequivocally, uh, James, Jimmy Stewart had a very naturalistic, wonderful, natural approach. Um, but naturalism hadn't taken its hold yet. And uh, Brando was so unique, so personal, coupled with Tennessee Williams writing, uh, you know, uh, he, he changed the way people, it was like watching a documentary. And Montgomery Clift had the same impact in Place in the Sun. Uh, he, you know, he, he was so defeated. This is another thing, the anti-hero, the, suddenly the guy who, the loser becomes the hero. The guy who is not John Wayne on top of the world who can just kill everybody with his six gun. It's a guy who's vulnerable, uh, kind of wounded, uh, kind of uh, messed up in some kind of way, like even a, a film that's not as good as On the Waterfront, uh, the motorcycle thing. Uh, Easy Rider? He, no, well, that's another one, but uh, Brando did a, a, The Wild One. Right. Uh, uh, Lee Marvin was in that too. And... Um, there was something about him that was very withdrawn, and I, 
suddenly imperfections in the personality became part of the medium. The guy didn't have to be on top of the world all the time to be interesting. And on the contrary, people who were losing a little and winning a little and losing a little, that's the way life is. They were more believable, you know. And this happened in the 50s. Mid 50s, 55, 56, you know. Streetcar was on Broadway around that time. Uh, those were the films that influenced me the most. I, I don't find it interesting to go to films anymore, although I think recently I saw one. Um, I forget what it was, but it was good. Get Out. Yeah. A lot of subtext in that movie. A lot of mm. uh, metaphor, a lot of... Oh, my goodness. Yeah. What advice would you give um, actors coming out today, starting out today? One sentence. If you keep on doing it, it'll work out. That's it. If I embellish it, it's not going to say more. Just keep doing it, and it'll work out. It's so simple, but my God, it's difficult. It means when things aren't working out, you're still going to do it. And boy, that's very difficult for anyone, you know. You might do a bad performance and know it. You might uh, have no money for a long period of time and you're doing some kind of menial work and you have a college degree and there's no reason why you should be doing this work aside from your career. You might be frightened. You might have anxiety attacks. You might be depressed. You might be exposed to drugs. There's so many hazards. And you just have to, you just do it, you know, and it'll work out. You come out the other side and then develop it into writing develop into painting, develop it into filmmaking. Keep doing it and it'll spread its wings. And you see, if you back off and you quit, you never feel right about yourself. I don't care what it is, if you quit at anything, you know, yeah. you get beat. It doesn't feel good to be beaten. And, you know, when you get to be 79 years old, you, you, you know that you hung in there and you didn't back off. And now, you know, I did it for 79 years and, okay, bring it on. 